I've been told that I, you can all hear me now. Is that right? Can you all hear me? Wave if you can hear. Wonderful. <clears throat> it's so good to see you all, brothers and sisters. And uh, isn't it wonderful to be at the table of the Lord? Whether you're at home watching in on Zoom or whether you're at the memorial meeting with your brothers and sisters, being at the table of the Lord can be the highlight of our week. And we've come this morning to remember, as we said, our Lord. We've come to remember our hero and leader, the captain of our salvation, but to do so through the lens of Gideon and his life. A man chosen by God for his spirit of kindness and for his intense care for the ecclesia. And I trust that as we've looked at this man this weekend, there have been moments when you've seen a glimmer, when you've got a glimpse of our Messiah and the spirit of Christ in him who contended with Baal. Gideon was a, a man who viewed himself as having a, a humble upbringing. He, he said, didn't he, his family was least among the thousands of Manasseh, and, and that should ring a bell, because it's just like the one of Bethlehem Ephratah, of whom Micah said, though thou be little amongst the thousands of Judah. Yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, he that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, even everlasting. Gideon was a man who said, if you remember, in, in Judges chapter 7, verse 17, he, he said to those that followed him, he said, on me shall you look, and in like manner shall ye do. And that's a turn of phrase that I think is, is echoed in 1 Corinthians 11, a passage we turn to almost every Sunday when the Lord told his disciples to do as he had done, to take, eat, and drink in remembrance of him. Well, I'm very confident that as Gideon descended to the valley floor that day, swordless, and with his 300 men, I'm very confident he would have whispered, thy will be done. This was a man who led his chosen ones, his host, to break their earthly pitches and to shine forth as lights. And he won a great victory over a wicked and sinful enemy. And in that description, I'm sure all of us can see not just Gideon, but our Lord, the one we're trying to remember and reflect on this morning. Our Lord really is in this story, isn't he? he? He is in the lower and the upper rock of the wine press, the crushed lower boulder and the high lofty crag. He, he is in the altar that Gideon built. He is in the ox that was the sacrifice and the fleece on which the Jew fell. Have a look, if you will, back at Judges chapter 6 and verse 38. Judges 6 and verse 38, I, I think this is a, a, an amazing little point, just hidden away here in the story. This is the miracle that, you know, might have been a miracle, might not have been. Judges chapter 6, verse 38, here's the miracle, and it says, And it was so. For he rose early in the morning, thrust the feast together, and wringed the dew out of the fleece a bowl full of water. So that's the miracle that wasn't, maybe was a miracle. The first sign, it was so. But look at what it says in verse 40 for the second miracle. And God did so that night. For it was dry upon the fleece only and there was dew on all the ground. Did, did you see that? In the first miracle, it's described almost as if Gideon's fear was right. Just. It happened. It was so. Maybe the first sign was not so miraculous. It, it just happened. But the second, oh, the second, definitely, God did so. And we said when we talked about it that the fleece spoke of Christ 
And a similar, almost identical word is mentioned in Isaiah 53, verse 7, where it talks of our Lord being led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before her shearers is dumb. Come across to, to, to Psalm chapter 16. Psalm 16. And, and we know this psalm really well. It's one we talk, to, talk about quite often when we talk about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Jew falling upon the fleece. Psalm 16, verse 9. Therefore, says our Lord, my heart is glad. My glory rejoices. My flesh shall rest in hope because or for you will not leave my soul in the grave. You will not suffer your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path back to life. Uh, we know the passages, don't we? The grave could not hold them. Come across to John chapter 10. John 10, verse 18. And in John chapter 10, verse 18, the Lord is addressing, well, it's the Lord's conversation on his, his role as the shepherd of the sheep and of, as the sheepfold. But in John chapter 10, verse 18, he says this to his sheep. Of his own life, he said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down myself i have power to lay it down and i have power to take it again this commandment have i received of the father do you, do you see what it's saying there it's saying that christ himself was invested with the power to be raised he said elsewhere, I am the resurrection and the life. And you see the resurrection, the first, uh, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, that first miracle. Yes, it required the power of God. And yet that power had been invested in our Lord. That resurrection was inevitable, almost like as it were a force of nature. The grave could not hold him. And it says that it was so. Oh, but for the, for the Jew of resurrection to fall upon the dusty men of this world upon you and upon me, our resurrection. Oh, that, that, that is different. That requires the intervention of God almighty. And so it says, and God did so that night. Can you see Christ in that little parable? He had strength to take his life again. He was given that by the father. But to raise us requires the intervention of God. And so in that little story, we were told that it was so when the Jew fell upon the fleece and God did so that night to raise you and me. The story of Gideon is a story of one whom our God made strong for himself. It is a story of, of one who gave himself as a sacrifice for the many who fought and defeated sin manifest in the flesh. And yet, of course, we know the symbol is imperfect, isn't it? It's an incomplete replica of he who we remember lovingly this morning. For, for although Gideon defeated the Midianites, his victory will be tragically short lived as we will see by and by. And so we rejoin Gideon in Judges chapter 6, verse 13, which we had read for us this morning. Judges chapter 6, verse 13. Uh, sorry, pardon me, Judges chapter 8, verse 13. Judges 8, verse 13. Where it says, And Gideon, the son of Joash, Return from the battle before the sun was up. We rejoin Gideon this morning as the sun's rays just streak over the hills. That first glimmer of pink upon the horizon, gilding the hill country of Judah from their vantage point. And 301 weary men finally cross back into the promised land. 
a land now freed from the scourge of Midian, Zeba and Zalmanna, their only prisoners. And I don't know if you noticed as we went through, but it's almost as if the whole story of Gideon happened at night. There was the midnight destruction of Baal's altar, wasn't there? There was the signs of the Jew, which always occurred at night. There was the battle with Midian that happened at night. There were dreams in the night, but now, now it's almost as if a new day dawns and a new age opens like the blinds of the morning. Young's literal says they returned at the going up of the sun. And verse 14, they caught a young man of the men of Succoth, and they inquired of him. They inquired of him. And he described unto Gideon the princes of Succoth. And for those of you who have got uh, a King James Bible with the, with the Oxford margin, you'll see that there's a little marginal note there. It says writ. He, he wrote down a description for them of these princes of Succoth. A book was written, but this one, this one's not a book of the names of those who spoke often one to another together about our God. No, th this is a book of condemnation and of judgment. And in verse 15, we read that he came to Succoth and he said to them, look, here they are. You ask me, as the palms of Zeba and Zalmanna in our hands? Well, they are. And you upbraided me about this, saying, are they in my hands? Well, here they are. And Gideon punishes the two towns of Succoth and Peniel for their attempted neutrality. You see, in the war with sin, there is no neutrality, is there? You cannot be neutral in the war with sin. There are only two sides. That's right, isn't it? That there's only God's side and the other side. There's no third side. There's no in between. In the war against sin, there is no Switzerland. And you see, these people's problem, uh, you can see it written. It's, it, it's there in verse 15. Behold, said they unto him, are the hands of Zebra and Zalmanna in your hand that we should give bread unto your men? And in the Hebrew, that word men is the word Enosh. It speaks of weak, sickly, frail men. And of course, as the men, the princes, the elevated princes of Succoth looked at Gideon's tired, weary, dirty, battle-stained soldiers, yes, they saw Enosh. They saw weak sickly men but the problem was they couldn't see that they themselves were Enosh actually the word used of the men of Succoth in both verse 14 and the men of Peniel in verse 17 is exactly that word weak sickly frail men they they could not see that they themselves were weak and frail and sickly too and so easy, isn't it, brothers and sisters? So easy for us to, to measure ourselves by the yardstick of others, by the yardstick of what Brother J is doing or the yardstick of what Sister Y. It's so easy to measure that, to see only 300 weary, weary dirty brothers and sisters and feel reassured that we're doing better and to miss the only measuring mark that actually matters, our Lord. Actually, my notes right now say point clearly at the table of the Lord, which of course is slightly difficult. Am I pointing the right way, Matt? Thank you, yes. So there is the only measuring mark that matters, the mark of our Lord who is emblemized before us this morning.
let's let's never let ourselves measure ourselves against what someone else is doing they're not going they're not involved so i don't need to be they didn't do much they weren't there that they said this it, it doesn't matter what anyone else does or says brothers and sisters it matters what he did it matters what he said and would he be there would he be helping would he be willing to give these men bread and so the punishment meted out by Gideon on this occasion illustrated the crime. He was going to, as Matt noted, tear their flesh with thorns and with briars. A very interesting teaching mechanism. Yes, indeed. But yet the punishment illustrated the crime because in Joshua 23 verse 13, Joshua had warned the children of Israel that those who made alliances with the world would suffer that the world would be snares and traps unto them, scourges in their sides and thorns in their eyes till they perished from the good land that God had given them. And here the thorns and the briars are used to teach the men of Succoth, while the tower of Penuel, in which these men trusted, was pulled down and these traitors, make, 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 make no mistake, that is what they were, traitors were slain. This is so tragic, isn't it, brothers and sisters? It is so sad. Here are communities of believers who should have known better. They should have, they really should have. Sakoth and Peniel are linked in the story of Jacob's life. Peniel was the place where Jacob wrestled the angel and he saw the face of God. In fact, that's what the town name means. It means the face of God. You live in a place called the face of God and somehow you can't see this point. And Sarkoth, Sarkoth was the place where Jacob commemorated his escape from Laban and from Esau, two men equally as vile as the spirit seen in Zebra and Zalmanah. And it was celebrated, that escape was celebrated by the first Feast of Tabernacles there at Succoth. That's why the Feast of Succoth, the Feast of Tabernacles is called Succoth. It's because it was celebrated there the Feast of Booze in which the whole nation celebrated their closeness and their friendship with God. But they missed that point. They lived in towns that, that celebrated their connection with the truth and with God, and they missed the point. They, these men had allowed Zeba and Zalmana to loom larger in their minds than God himself. The stresses and the worries of this life had diminished his presence in their lives. And we can do that too, brothers and sisters, can't we? It can be really hard, really hard for us at times to see that the things that we face in this life, they're not as big as he is. They do not matter as much as he does. Um, but we do. We let the shadows loom large. We let Zeba and Zalmana creep into our minds. And at times that means we stop seeing the community we're part of. We stop seeing the Lord who we follow. We stop seeing the God who is the infinite fire at the center of the universe, completely capable of dealing with any problem we could face. Well, as for Zeba and Zalmana, the time has now come for them to answer for their crimes. Zeba, whose name meant to slaughter, a gruesome, violent monarch. And Zalmana, whose name spoke of stripping away all defenses, leaving people utterly defenseless, a king without mercy. These men, that they're self-confessed murderers who had personally and in cold blood, not in the heat of the battlefield, this didn't happen on the battlefield, he had, they had murdered Gideon's brothers. That's what that conversation in verse 18 and 19 is all about. Gideon says, do you remember? Do you remember the men you, you killed? They were my brothers. 
and Zebra and Zalmana remembered them. This was not someone they slew while they flew by on the back of a camel, barely having a chance to look at their faces. No, they looked deep into their eyes before they killed them, and these men were murderers. <clears throat> and so Gideon now dispatches them publicly. This probably occurred in the town square in Ofra, or perhaps in the valley of Jezreel. Jetha, the son of Gideon, is now with Gideon, and it seems unlikely that his young son, pardon me, <coughs> his young son, it seems unlikely Jetha would have traveled with Gideon on this journey. Now, I'm aware I've become out of focus. I will try and resolve that for us. Pardon me. I'm not sure what's happening there. You're just going to have to cope until my camera decides uh, to show me a little bit less blurrily. Um, there we go. We're back. All right. So I'll have to remember not to cough. It makes everything become unfocused. Um, Jetha is there with them. It's unlikely that Jetha traveled all the way up to Karkor, was a member of those 300, as he was such a young son, he was unwilling to kill an enemy. And so it seems likely that at this point in time, Gideon has returned either to Ofra or alternatively, he stands in the valley of Jezreel, surrounded by all Israel to witness this end of their oppression, the execution of Ziba and Zalmanah. And he does one other thing, doesn't he? The, the final thing that he does in closing out the oppression of the Midianites was to collect their round ornaments. The ornaments, we're told, that were made in the shape of the moon. These were tokens of the goddess of the grove that Gideon had already torn down in Ophrah. And so now Gideon removes these in the sight of all, as it were, a final act of dismissal and of disparagement, showing, rather than saying in typical Gideon fashion, that here, here in these was the source of Israel's problem. Worship not of the one true God, but of others. And now their owners are dead, and these trinkets, O oh Israel, failed to help them in any way at all. And the message would be absolutely clear. And in verse 22 and 23, the witnesses of this final act speak out. They speak and they say, the men of Israel said unto Gideon, rule thou over us. Set up a dynasty, Gideon, and rule over us from son to son to son, because you have saved us. You, Gideon, have saved us from the hand of Midian. Isn't, isn't this truly tragic? Many of the people saying this had been sent home from Herod. Doubtless, they had heard that in the end, there were just 300. They would have felt the enormous scale of this victory and the weight lifted from their shoulders. But somehow, they completely missed the point, didn't they? Back in chapter 7 and verse 2, the Lord had said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands lest Israel vaunt themselves against me saying mine own hand hath saved me the, the whole point of of filtering the number of soldiers down until there were just 300 was that God not Gideon had delivered them God had given the victory and and Gideon got that point a man who was waiting for Yahweh's king, I will not rule over you. My son will not rule over you. Yahweh, he's the one who should rule over you, who gave you the victory. And in verse 24, uh, we read something saddening, really. 
Gideon has a request and he wants the earrings of the prey. Uh, as we've already said, these, these earrings are likely in the shape of a moon, celebrating the moon goddess. These are amulets, if you like, good luck charms worn by the Midianites. And there are 135,000 of these to be collected. Now, doubtless, as Gideon says, look, give them to me, he had a good motive. No doubt what Gideon was... <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> no doubt what Gideon was trying to ensure was that Israel did not return to worshipping the goddess these amulets were made in the honour of. And yet, brothers and sisters, compromise never, ever, ever succeeds. It never helps us get closer to God. And, and what? Results here is a compromise. Verse 27. And Gideon made an ephod thereof. And he put it in his city, even in Ophrah, and all Israel went thither, whoring after it. Which thing became a snare unto Gideon and to his house? <clears throat> no one's safe from idolatry. Not even Gideon, he who contended against Baal. And you see what it said? It was a snare unto Gideon. Idolatry is a snare, a trap. Now, now what's the point of a snare or a trap? Well, well the point is, the, the only point is, is that its prey cannot see what it is until it's inside it, until it's too late. You don't make a trap and put a big sign on it saying, this is a trap. That's the opposite of what you're meant to do. And you see, idolatry can look nothing like idolatry from the outside, can't it? And yet bear all its hallmarks from within. It distances us from God. It consumes our time and attention. It makes us dependent on something other than him. But from the outside, it looked like, well, it just looked like a subscription service. Nine bucks a month. Very reasonable. It, it, look, I needed a new phone. That's what I needed. And, and look, uh, there was a good deal. It's such a good way to connect with friends, isn't it? And to stay in touch. And I can send photos to my family and friends around the world. I, I thought it was a great way to stay fit, get in shape. I, I've been a bit worried about that recently. It's something I'm really looking forward to. And from the outside, it looks so innocuous. Brothers and sisters, I'm not trying to say what idolatry is for you. I'm trying to say what it is for me. And please, please, please don't think that I'm standing here in some ivory tower impervious to idolatry. This challenges me. And I honestly can't say that I'm winning, brothers and sisters. I wish, I wish that I could. But let's not fool ourselves. Let, let's at least call it for what it is. First of Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 to 14 says this. So then let him who thinks he is standing securely beware of falling. No temptation has you in its power, but such as is common to human nature. And God is faithful and will not allow you to be tempted beyond your strength. But when the temptation comes, he will also provide the way of escape so that you may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee idolatry. So how did Gideon fail? What was it that Gideon did wrong? It was exactly what we said. He failed to see it for what it was. Did you see what he called his idolatry? Verse 27. It was an ephod. I've made. No, 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 no. That, that's not an idol. That's an ephod. 
it's different. He didn't realize he couldn't see. He couldn't see that it was an idol until it was too late. What a tragedy. None of us are immune. Brothers and sisters, let's start calling idolatry for what it is. We know what it is when we're in it. Let's see it and say it for what it is and have the courage to acknowledge idolatry where it lies because that's got to be the first step, doesn't it, brothers and sisters? As soon as we can say, that's not an ephod, that's an idol. That's not Netflix, that's an idol. That's not a new phone, that's, that's an idol. As soon as we can start saying that, at least to ourselves, we're on the way. Well, Gideon's care for the ecclesia, his willingness to stand and be counted, his faith and his bravery, despite his doubts and his fears, his trust issues, they won a great victory. Verse 28, thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel so that they no, lifted their heads no more and the country was in quietness 40 years in the days of Midian. 40 years of peace won by one man's actions. And yet, within a generation, all that Gideon had done would be forgotten, and not just forgotten, completely undone. Verse 33, it came to pass as soon as Gideon was dead that the children of Israel turned again. They went straight back to where they had been and went whoring after Balaam and made Baal bereth their God. It's almost as if they were saying, thank goodness he's gone. We can get back to what we were doing when he first arrived. And the children of Israel remembered not Yahweh their God who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side. 135,000 Midianites, Zeba, Zalmana, Oreb and Zeb. God had saved them from all of those with just 300 men and no swords. Neither showed they kindness to the house of he who contended with Baal, namely Gideon according to all the goodness which he showed unto Israel. That, that's the last word we have of Gideon, his goodness. And isn't that, don't you think that's a lovely summary of this man? Goodness. Unfailingly polite. I pray you, I beg of you, if I have found favor, a man whose first sentence in the record screams his care for his brothers and sisters. If God be with, not me, us, us, us. A man who needed someone alongside in the night. He called 10 friends as he headed down to the camp. He took Führer, a man who needed others to be with him. The warmth of a friend beside him. Oh, this was a man who showed goodness. But all that was to be lost, wasn't it? Within a generation, Gideon's legacy will be gone. His hard-won victories completely lost. And furthermore, his family all but wiped out, wiped out. 70 of his sons will be dead within one chapter. By the end of chapter 9, 70 of his sons will have died and only one son will, not certainly, but potentially have survived living, one would assume, in a witness protection program somewhere far, far away. The family of Gideon is never heard of again. And Gideon's reform, his battle with Baal, 
for which he won the name Jeroboam. It failed, brothers and sisters, in the end completely and abjectly. What a tragic end. Gideon was a great hero. He was a man who stood in the breach when no one else would stand. And let's recall for a minute why our God chose him. We know his first words in the story, words of railing accusation against God, hurt and betray, uh, hurt and betrayal showed in every element of his stance and his face. And yet it demonstrated a yearning care for his brothers and sisters. God chose him because he had a willingness to see the issues and tackle them, even if it meant risking friendship and family to tear down what is wrong. Think of what he risked when he tore down his own family's idol. In the end, his trust was in God. And that was a trust so deep that he could face the Midianite horde armed with nothing but a trumpet and a torch. Would you do that? Because I don't think I would. But he did. Because he trusted his God. These are the reasons our God picked this man. God didn't choose Gideon because he was the most perceptive or the strongest or the bravest. But because he could make Gideon those things. And God didn't choose you or me, my dear brothers and sisters, because we were the most perceptive, the strongest or the bravest servants he could find either. But he did choose us. That's why we're here this morning. That is evidence of his selection of us. And he did make Gideon exact, exactly the man he needed him to be. We began our weekend together speaking of how Gideon wasn't confident. How Gideon wasn't born, if you like, with a cape, ready to go forth and be a hero. We talked about how Gideon was scared and insecure and in need of support and kind words. And God knew all this. God knew his man before ever the angel sat under the oak in Ophrah. When Gideon was scared, God spoke to him and said, peace be to you, fear not. When Gideon doubted, God made Jew fall and Midianites dream of tents and barley cakes. When Gideon couldn't do it on his own, God sent Führer with him. And God showed him he could with just 300 men and no swords. God did it and made Gideon exactly who he needed him to be. And if we'd spoken to Gideon before and if we'd asked him, Gideon might have said, use me, Lord, but please, please don't make it hurt. But looking back, from the vantage point of the end of the story, he would have realized that he could handle more pain, more fear, stand against far more enemies and face angrier lynch mobs than he ever had thought possible when the God of Israel stood beside him. God's first words to Gideon were, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And when God was with him, he was a mighty man of valor. 
and Gideon's reform might have failed in the end, but in the end, God's reform in Gideon did not. Let's turn to our almost final passage, Hebrews chapter 11. We had to come here in the end, didn't we? We've been circling around this passage all weekend. It's our title for the weekend. Hebrews chapter 11, the catalogue of the faithful and verse 32. But what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak of Samson and of Jephthah, of David and of Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant, there's Gideon, in fight and turned to fight the armies of the aliens. In the end, Gideon was the man that God wanted him to be. And God's reform in Gideon means that he is now amongst the catalogue of the faithful. And if God can do that for Gideon, he can do it for for each of us, can't he, brothers and sisters? We might feel like our prayer is, God, use me, but please don't make it hurt. But maybe from the vantage point of the kingdom, we will realise that we could handle a lot more when God stood beside us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed around with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, every idolatry, and the sin which does so easily ensnare us. Let's run with patience the race set before us and look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, the spirit of Christ in Gideon, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and right now is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And we began our exhortation this morning with a meditation, uh, our memorial this morning with a meditation hymn. It was hymn 136, and we're going to close our memorial meeting with that same hymn. Father, hear the prayer we offer. Not for ease, that prayer shall be, but for strength that we may ever live our lives courageously. Not forever in green pastures do we ask our way to be, but the steep and rugged pathway may we tread rejoicingly. Not forever by still waters would we idly rest and stay, but would smite the living fountains from the rocks along our way. Be our strength in hours of weakness. In our wanderings, be our guide. Through endeavour, failure, danger, Father, be thou at our side. Just wait for the gentleman to get up. I think we can all relate to Gideon, can we not? I think all of us feel flawed, we feel compromised, and to be honest, I think we all feel ever so slightly scared. And um, not only that, we don't have idols in our backyard, we have them in our pockets, in our lounges, 
and in our bedchambers. And I think we all know, brothers and sisters, that no one here is standing as a paragon of strength, being able to navigate the way clearly. I think we all know that we feel like Gideon. We feel like we're compromised. But as our brother Dan has said, sometimes we just have to start by calling it as it is. To tell our children, this is what it is. This is the world we find ourselves in. And that can be the start of God doing amazing things, which is clearly what he did in the life of Gideon. And so, brothers and sisters, on your behalf, I'd like to thank our brother Dan for really powerfully calling it for what it is. Thank you. We now, we now come to the, the upper room, brothers and sisters. And we find that this whole theme of God's strength being made perfect in weakness continues. As we have our Lord in the upper room with, with fishermen, with tax gatherers, with, with burnt out zealots, with people who were despised Galilean. And with that small group of people, he turned them into what he needed them to be. So, brothers and sisters, we enter that upper room and we look at what our Lord did. He had a table furnished. He shared a meal. And out of that meal, the bread and the wine, something amazing happened. Through the bread and the wine, a new covenant, a new relationship, a new community was forged. And here we are 2,000 years later, sharing in a rather unusual way the same spirit of that upper room. And so in verse 19 of Luke chapter 22, it says, He took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. And so, brothers and sisters, let us give thanks for the bread. Our great and eternal Father in heaven, we approach before thee humbled and yet inspired by what we have heard and witnessed this morning in the example of thy servant Gideon. We see, Father, the parallels are very clear. But we see, Father, in all of this that we just have to be willing and we just have to care. Father, also all of us here do care, and we are willing. And so, fathers, we partake of this bread, and we look at the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in every way was like us, who got tired, who got hungry, who felt pain, who was frustrated by the mortality that he shared, tempted in every way like we are, yet without sin. And as we take the bread inside of us, Father, help us to gain encouragement from that. Help us to gain encouragement from his life, his lineage, that, that in him there was nothing special that people found noteworthy. But the words he spoke, the truth that he showed, and the kindness that he shared made him thy son. And so, Father, help us as we take the bread to emulate in our own flawed and compromised ways that spirit, as we know we all can. In Jesus' name we ask this prayer. Amen. And he took the bread and he gave thanks for it, and he broke it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do as you remember me.
will now give thanks for the wine. Again, our Father, we come before thee at this time to thank thee for the wine that we're about to partake. Father, we know that this is the lifeblood of our Lord Jesus Christ that was poured out in dedication for everybody. And Father, from our vantage point of being able to read thy Gospels, we know that our Lord went around doing good. He touched people who no one wanted to touch. He spoke to people that no one wanted to talk to. The bruised reed he didn't break and the smoking flax he didn't quench. And he lifted up people and showed them a better way. And through his example, he brought peace. The Father, we find ourselves as a group of believers in an age where people are broken, lost, confused. And help us, Father, to look at the example of our Lord Jesus Christ and to be Christ to these people, to show kindness, to be honest, to keep things real, to tell it how it is, and offer a ray and a glimmer of hope in a rather hopeless world. Help us, Father, to be, com be confident in our gifts, to be confident in the strengths that we've been given, and to show thy light to everybody. And as we partake of this wine, Father, and we look at the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, help us to be strengthened and encouraged and to stride forward in the coming week with confidence. In Jesus' name we ask this prayer. Amen. It says, Likewise, the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant, the new promise, the new testament in my blood, which is shed for you. And so, brothers and sisters, in that small upper room filled with people who were counted as nothing of no reputation, a spark was lit that transformed the entire world. So, Father, with, we, we, I don't know why I keep calling you Father. <laughs> brothers and sisters, so it can be with us, even as the world is its darkest point, a yeah, spark can still be lit. We can still shine brightly. And I think we've all re received the encouragement to know that we can do that. And as we know in the upper room, they, they sang a hymn before they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane. And our orchestra is now in place. So let us all rise and sing with feeling hymn 242.
Thanks, Brother Mark. Well, my dear brothers and sisters, we've had a very special morning, a uh, rather unusual morning. I grew up with Dan. He was always slightly larger than life, but that was a bit ridiculous. But anyway. Um, but no, we, we've had a, a very encouraging morning, I feel. I think we've all been impressed with the Christ measure, have we not? And what the Christ measure does, not one another, is that it, it humbles us and it confronts us with our limitations because Jesus is all of us. He's not each and every one of us, all of us combined. Yet in the Christ measure, brothers and sisters, we find our place. We find in the service of Christ something we can all relate to something which brings out our strengths, the things that we can offer, the things that contribute. And in our weakness, we can find strength to be more like Christ, despite our weaknesses. And if anything, the example of Gideon demonstrates that, that God can light a fire in anyone, anyhow. Sometimes we just have to be willing to take those first halting steps, and God will do the rest. So brothers and sisters, we're singing our meditation hymn again. So sing it with feeling and passion, 136. great and loving Father in heaven. We thank 